Buenas and half a day, I'm Tanya Chumpakumindiola with Joint Region Marianas Public Affairs and you're watching Island Images. Today we are here um, at the Heritage Hall and Anderson Air Force Base and we are going to talk about two different sites that are part of the public access plan. Standing right next to me is base historian Jeff Meyer. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Pleasure. Hey. And then of course we all know Dave Snyder who's the public access plan program coordinator. So Dave, I'm gonna ask you a couple of things. Um, first of all, what are we gonna see today here and what is the importance of the public access plan? Well, uh, we've come up to Anderson Air Force Base today to see uh, uh, a fascinating little museum. Uh, it's called Heritage Hall. It's uh, right here at the terminal and it tells the history of Anderson Air Force Base and it's one of uh, Jeff Meyer's passions. And there's a lot of interesting things to see and learn about the history of Anderson and the military on Guam in this building. And then later we're going to go out to a site uh, in the jungle nearby where a B-52 uh, landed and Jeff's going to tell us about uh, that when we get there but it's the site of a B-52 and it's called the Grey Ghost. Those are two of the sites that you can see on the public access plan and the public access plan has been in effect maybe a little over a year now on Guam. <clears throat> it's little known, we're still trying to roll it out but it's intended for uh, the people of Guam that don't have access to the military bases to be able to come onto the military base and see select sites that have to do with Chamorro history or World War II history. Um, they're, they're basically cultural sites. Some of them involve a little bit of hiking, uh, but some, some of them are just drive-bys. You can go, stop the car, and, and, and t take a look. But you have to um, apply to go through this. You have to be vetted. If you don't already have a military ID card, you have to be vetted. So they have to know that you're a safe person to come on base. And the, I run this program. It's called the Public Access Plan. I can bring up to seven people. Um, at a time and we can visit sites like Sumai uh, on Naval Base Guam. We can visit sites like the Grey Ghost here um, and it's, it's, it's a great plan. Okay, so uh, you're, you talked about vetting and you talked about application process. Is, is there somewhere online or somewhere, somewhere where people can go to pick up an application? Uh, Joint Region Marianas has <clears throat> a, a website and on the Joint Region Marianas website, you can find about uh, you can find out about the plan, and the 44 sites that are available, and the necessary forms, and my phone number. And I also believe at the end of this uh, Island Images presentation, you'll put my uh, some contact information yeah. for me. So Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about the Heritage Hall here, and also about uh, Anderson's history here in Guam, military history? Oh, thanks for asking. The uh, history of Anderson Air Force Base actually started as North Field in 1944 when they started doing the construction here. Uh, this is one of three bases that were here during World War II, the other one being Harmon, uh, which was originally called Guam Depot Field and then Northwest Field. And when General Harmon uh, died in a plane crash along with General Anderson, whose picture is right there behind you, uh, his painting, uh, they named Harmon, Harmon, and we still call it today Harmon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Anderson was actually name of this base starting in 1949. Mm -hmm. So Harmon, it, it was originally Harmon Air, Airfield, which was my understanding was that it was the original village of Dedido around that area. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it became an airfield, that was Upper Tumon area. It's now known as the Upper Tumon yes. Harmon Industrial Park area, mm -hmm. right? So that whole area there used to be an airfield. Yes, all the way from Micronesian Mall to Kmart, pretty much all the way to the cliff line on both sides. Right about here, this would be where Kmart is today. So you go behind Kmart and like it &E and all that's down here. That's the industrial yes, park. Yes, yeah, that's where it's all at. So that's that's where Kmart would be, and then up here in the corner would be where Micronesian Mall is today. And then over here would be the two-story McDonald's. One of these roads here would be the two-story McDonald's where Harmon Loop Road is today. It's so all field, this, yeah. and then all this would be Industrial Park. And then the 20th Air Force, all their headquarters buildings, everything were all the way out toward Two Lovers Point. So when did they discontinue the use of Harmon Air 1949. Okay. Why? They, to build Anderson or? No, they just moved everything that was there up here and they just shut it down because of, uh, it was before the Korean War and they're still kind of doing some drawdowns and then, then the Korean War happened. So this place got built up. B-29s were stationed here. Uh, this is 
traditionally known as a bomber base because of the strategic location of it. So through the years, since this base has been here, it's been a bomber base. So, so Dave, can you explain to me why was Heritage Hall selected as one of the public access sites? When they asked the public, they, they queried the public uh, about things that they would like to see on Guam. And there were many responses, and uh, so they kind of filtered them out, and Heritage Hall was one of the sites that people thought, hey, there's a museum on Anderson, and it's pretty interesting, and a lot of people haven't seen it, so we put that on. Anderson looked like. So it's all a chronological history of the history of this base. This is actually old 100 and this seat is from that that aircraft right there. Daniel, one of the uh, things that Jeff has told me that he really enjoys are these model planes, and this is a really fine collection of model planes. Uh, what are some of your favorites here? Well, it's actually all of them are pretty much pretty awesome. Uh, they're all built. <laughs> they're all built by a gentleman named Chuck McManus, who is a close friend of mine. He is actually a World War II vet, Vietnam vet. He was here during ArcLight, and, and uh, he was here at the end of World War II, and. This was his hobby, he built all these. And a lot of people who've been to other museums in the States, they, they come here and they can't believe there's such a large collection of all these different Japanese uh, models here from World War II. They've never seen that. And then you put that their counterparts, the US versions of them on the other side, and you can really stand here and just do a good comparison. There's some other ones mixed in on the bottom here, but the, mostly these top three shelves, four shelves here are probably the best collection of Japanese and U.S. model 172 scale models. So the museum, who runs the museum? I mean, how? I'm the over, I oversee it, but we have uh, two volunteers who are actually assigned by the general to be, they call them historic, historic property custodians, and they actually are overseeing the, the items that are from the museum. That's part of the uh, regulations that we have. So they're like my assistants. These are World War II spotter cards, and the purpose of it was for each military member that was in a combat zone, or even in the States, they're getting trained or whatever, they can play cards and still be able to uh, learn by identifying each card. So you can see here, uh, the spades was US, and then uh, this, the hearts was British, and then uh, diamonds was German, and then clubs was Japanese. So people could identify uh, what aircrafts were flying over, you know, their base or whatever, or if they're in the air, so. And since each one is different, you couldn't play with those too often with the same ones, or they would know if you had the Jack of Diamonds, because <laughs> they'd know which plane it was. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we just came from Heritage Hall and now we're, we are here at the Grey Ghost Relic and we're going to walk in the jungle and Jeff is going to tell us a little bit more about this relic. So what you see right here is part of a B-52 called the Grey Ghost. So Jeff, uh, tell us a little bit about this. This is the tail section of a B-52E that was brought here in 1970 and it was here basically to be a parts airplane for all the B-52s operating out of here during the Vietnam War. Then later on in 1972, it became pretty much useless, so it was moved over here right across the street to the fire department for egress and firefighting training. Uh, during that time, they usually cut the tails off. So they cut the tail off of this one, I think, in 1973. Uh, interesting thing that happened though, we had Super Typhoon Pamela in 1976. She flipped him. Well, she flipped the whole airplane that was out there, flipped it right over on its top, and we'll get pictures of that. And then this section was actually blown probably, I would say 300 feet across the street in the up to what, 185 mile an hour winds. And it put this big chunk of a B-52 out here in the jungle. This aircraft was actually misnamed for many years. It was called the Old 100 Relic. Uh, but it was not painted like the old 100, so 
we went back through and did some research on it and found out it had to be one of these three aircraft that were actually here being used for training and or being used for parts. So the Grey Ghost was applied to this surplus plane on the runway yes. that they used to cannibalize for other parts yes. and things like that. Mm -hmm. But only one of the three planes that was referred to as the Grey Ghost was picked up and by brought. Super and yes. brought here. And that's, yes. that would be the... The second one. The second one. Yes. All right. Cool. And I understand this was... Nobody knew this was here for a number of years. Uh, yes, until uh, Typhoon... Oh my goodness. Typhoon Russ. Was it Russ? Russ or Roy or Yuri, one of those. And, 1990s. And uh, this, all this brush got blown away and they're like, there's a plane in there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like when you go on Navy Base Guam, another uh, public access plan site is the amphitheater. Amphitheater, which was undiscovered for quite a few years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Dave, as the public access plan program coordinator, why do you think um, something like the Grey Ghost would be uh, important for people to know about? Well, the beauty of uh, the public access plan is of the, of the 44 sites in the plan, we came up with a number of sites that range from ancient Chamorro stuff all the way to like the 1930s when the Pacific Clipper came to the 1970s. So somebody uh, that served in the military in Vietnam and, you know, or, or earlier and wanted to see a, a B-52, here it is. So there's something for everybody in the public access plan. Anderson Air Force Base is one of the most historic air bases in the Air Force that's still active. I mean, two wars were fought here, two other Cold War, you know, the Korean War was kind of backwater here, but the Cold War was also fought here. Uh, so I would say that there's a lot of history up here that a lot of people on Guam don't really know about, even Harmon of all things, you know, Harmon, where'd Harmon get its name? Uh, so. There's a lot of things that people can see on those panels and see the history of, of Anderson Air Force Base and Northwest Field and Harmon uh, in that Heritage Hall. And then you can actually touch out and reach out and touch something from the Vietnam War era that, uh, you know, is amazing that you couldn't get close to. Big, huge B-52 and here's a piece of it right here, you know, so. As always, we hope you learned a lot from this latest episode of Island Images and the Public Access Plan. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for always joining you're us. You're welcome. Jeff, thank you for teaching us a lot. All right, you're welcome. So, okay, with that, until next time, adios. Adios. adios.